Hello, and welcome to Safanat's first animated article. We hope it adds value to your life. And if you enjoyed watching or listening, please make sure to like and subscribe to our channel. Every one of us has been guilty of assuming the simple answer is the correct one, or that there are only two options to choose from and one must be right. In 2020 in particular, it seems like either Black Lives Matter or All Lives Matter, the right or the left is correct, and the president is doing good or evil. The bitter pill to swallow is that the truth in all cases is a combination of multiple perspectives and that if we want to work towards an objective truth, we must be willing to part with our position and consider the best of both sides. After rereading Freakonomics, I've been reminded of two truths that are essential to know in this age of information. First is that our initial understanding of events is almost always too simple to be correct. And the second is that humans respond to incentives, and we must consider the incentives that motivate who is giving us information to, before we can determine how much we can trust it. The world is a wild and complicated place that most of us misunderstand at first blush. And current events that occupy our minds, such as crime, are often oversimplified in regards to their causes. And this is because we need closure and don't want to use the energy required to explore complicated scenarios. And as Jonathan Gottschall mentioned in his book, The Storytelling Animal, the human mind is tuned to detect patterns and it is biased towards false positives rather than false negatives, meaning that we default to taking easily accessible information and drawing conclusions from it, even if it is likely incorrect. The authors of Freakonomics put an extreme effort to overcome this bias by exploring the hidden side of everything. And if we want to advance from my truth to the truth on a given subject, we should work to develop this habit. While this book is filled with examples of unexpected relationships between events, the one that made my jaw drop was with respect to why crime in the U.S. decreased in the 1990s. So in the 90s, crime was rampant, and the only difference in the predictions of how the rest of the decade would go was not if it would get worse, but by how much. And what astonished everyone was that crime decreased significantly. And afterwards, everyone that predicted it would get worse already had an answer ready as to why it decreased, attributing the reduction in crime to some effort to curb crime, such as increased policing and that. But again, they were all wrong. The real reason crime dropped so significantly was due to abortion being legalized approximately 20 years earlier in 1973. As the authors describe, children born into adverse family conditions are much more likely to become criminals, and the women most likely to pursue an abortion were in those adverse conditions. In short, crime was being aborted. Please note that this example is not meant to argue for or against abortion, but mainly to show how a seemingly unrelated and distant cause could drive such a dramatic effect. But in other words, simply because two things are correlated does not mean that one causes the other. So in using the previous example, the decline in crime in the 90s correlated with enhanced policing efforts, but as we saw, this was not the cause of the decline in crime. And this makes it so that it's truly a superpower to be able to honestly weigh the merits of multiple options, especially since we tend to quickly prefer one over the others. But when moving away from the comfort of initial preferences, it's imperative to consider the incentives driving the perspective that others share with you. In many cases, we're all aware that incentives drive the experts that we interact with. But the most obvious example is how we perceive a stereotypical car salesman who is willing to say anything to sell you a car. We're all aware that their incentive is to sell us a car quickly so they can make money and that because of this, we shouldn't immediately believe everything that they tell us. The same is true of experts of all kinds. Although the incentives are more subtle for some, all experts are human and humans respond to incentives. And how any given expert treats you, therefore, will depend on how that expert's incentives are set up. Now, this information isn't meant to make you distrust all experts, but to remind you that your interests are likely not 100% aligned and that understanding their incentives will let you know if they are 95% or 10% aligned with your interests. And while the stereotypical car salesman may only be 5% aligned with your need, 
uh, to find a vehicle that you want and 95% driven by the commission check, Freakonomics provides a great example of the more common case where an expert may appear in perfect support of your needs until you reach a certain threshold. Through observing how real estate agents approach selling their own home versus that of their clients, the authors found that when using the data from the sales of approximately 100,000 Chicago homes and controlling for many variables such as location, age, quality of the home, aesthetics, and so on, it turned out that real estate agents kept their own home on the market an average of 10 days longer and they sell for an extra three plus percent or around $10,000 on a $300,000 home. Now all this means that when they sell their own homes, agents hold out for the best offer, but when they sell yours, they push you to take the first decent offer that comes along. And this is because their share of the commission on an extra $10,000 that you would get is only $150 that goes into their pocket, which is not enough to make the agent put in an additional two weeks of effort. So although the agent's interests were mostly aligned with the sellers, when it came time to put in an additional effort that would primarily benefit the seller, the agent's true incentives revealed themselves. In this age of information, opposing views often have a gravity to them that pulls people to one side or the other. And while each side is riddled with emotionally charged stances, they also contain fragments of the truth. One of my favorite quotes from the book is that when moral posturing is replaced by an honest assessment of the data, the result is often a new, surprising insight. The fact that we have experts trying to persuade us to one side or another is actually a blessing in disguise. Since they have opposing incentives, if they both share the same information, it's much more likely that it's an objective fact we can believe in. It's not easy to consider the opposite of our views, but in doing so, we inevitably come closer to understanding the topic much better and allowing for civil, constructive conversation, which is the foundation of making the world a better place. Thanks for taking the time to stick with it to the end of our first animated article. Again, we hope it brings some value to your life. And if you liked it, uh, please make sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel to be notified when more great content comes out.